My name is Gajan, and I'm a PhD candidate at ETH Zurich. And today, I would like to share my experience on building an internet for robots and introduce you to the wonderful world of robotics. But before doing that, um, to put us all on the same page, uh, let's do a reality check in robotics. The media nowadays has heavily hyped our expectation in robots. And Hollywood is the biggest culprit. So how many of you know the robot on the left? Yes, that's the Terminatrix from the movie. And she has superhuman capabilities. On the background, you see the truck that she has just toned down. And she can even shape shift. On the right is a real robot, a state of the art service robot in used in more than 40 universities around the world. Although it's one of the coolest robots, real robots, it has no chance against the Terminatrix. <laughs> so the PR2 can be easily outwitted by a five-year-old. It's very slow in moving, and it has trouble seeing things when it's outdoors. And if you want to buy it, it may cost you as much as five high-end SUVs. So not, that's not that great, right? So you may be wondering, what can the real robots do? So let's look at a video that's 10 years old. So here, you see PR1, a predecessor of PR2, cleaning a living room. Although the video is uh, sped up a little bit, it's still impressive. Um, I would like to have one. And <laughs> since we are all out of our homes during work, the floor is fine as long as the house is clean when we are back. So how many of you want to have the robot? <laughs> but sorry, unfortunately, I have to disappoint you again. So there was a trick in this video. Of course, there was no tiny man inside the robot, but this robot was fully remote controlled by a graduate student like me sitting behind the camera. Spitty. And 10 years have passed. We still cannot buy a robot that can do what you saw here. This video raises an important point, and the point being that we have the necessary hardware, but what is really missing is the intelligence or the software. Now, why is this a big problem? To see this, we have to look at how is life as a robot. In short, life as a robot sucks. <laughs> so life as a robot goes like this. You open your eyes for the first time, be, being awake for a few hours. When you close and open your eyes again, you almost remember nothing. And you don't have friends to talk to and learn from each other's experience. So it's like, in human terms, it's like having a short-term memory and living inside a cave for the whole life. So what's the solution? The solution is to connect these robots together and build an internet for robots. An internet similar to ours, where we can communicate and share our knowledge and learn from each other. And many more things, such as we act. So, um, so, t t so what I'm going to do during this talk, I'm going to introduce a few elements that are necessary to build such an internet for robots. While doing that, I'm going to reason why do we need it specifically for robotics? Because some of you may be wondering, why can't we use just the internet we have? So the first element we need to build an internet is language. So those of you who have a little bit experience in programming would have realized that the machine language is significantly different from the human language we use, such as English, German, or Tamil. Um, the machine language are very rigid, precise, and they're very explicit. While the human languages are kind of easygoing, and they assume a lot of common sense. And this difference is the biggest reason why our robots cannot just download a cooking recipe and cook us a nice dinner. For example, uh, most of the cooking recipes will tell you to switch on your stove when you start cooking. And really, none of them tell you to switch it off, because that's such a common sense for us, but not for the poor robot. <laughs> so, but let's ask this question. What if we had a language that's flexible enough to represent any general task? And what if, if we had a pool of common sense knowledge the robot has access to? 
to answer this question, let's go back to Hollywood. So this movie was introduced before. How many of you know this movie? Remember the context of the scene? OK, so here, um, Trinity is trying to help her partner, Neo, escape. So for this, she has to fly a helicopter, and, but she doesn't know how to fly one. So she calls and asks to download a program to fly a helicopter into her brain. So the program gets downloaded, and after a second, she jumps into the helicopter and flies like a pro. Well, downloading a program into a human brain may look like science fiction. But downloading a program into a robot is a piece of cake if you have the right language. So here is what we did. Of course, our funding agency, the European Commission, didn't give us enough money to play with helicopters. And that would have been dangerous, too. So what we did is we had two robots, two different robots, in two different locations in the city of Munich. So they both downloaded a common program which told them how to serve a drink for a patient. So the important thing to remember about this program is that it was written in a way it is independent of the robot's hardware or the environment it was operating on. So here you see the first robot, the PR1, opening the door and grasping the bottle or the juice and then serving to the patient. Well, there's no, there kind of a virtual person, patient. It just drops. So then the second robot downloads the same recipe, a different robot, a different environment, and still opens the door. And serves the drink. That was one of our PhD students. He's not really sick. <laughs> so um, so in addition to downloading a common program and using in two different robots, there was one more important thing in this video. So the first robot initially didn't know how to open the IKEA cabinet. And, but it had the right sensors to learn how to do it. So what it did was it learned how to open the door and uploaded that knowledge of opening into a common repository to be shared by other robots. So if another robot um, faces an IKEA cabinet, it can just download it and execute it without learning from scratch. So this brings us to the next element of building an internet for robots, which is the storage. So compared to us humans, robots produce a lot of data. So here, the biggest challenge is to um, develop algorithms that can extract only the important information or patterns from all this data that's produced by the robots. So these patterns can be a milk is typically found inside a refrigerator. Or it can be when you open the refrigerator door, typically you had to pull harder in the initial stages to overcome the magnetic lock. So these patterns found from the data eventually becomes common sense that can be used by robots. So in addition to the language and storage, now we're going to move to the third element, which is the computation. So um, this is what happens when you ask a question to Siri, your voice-based personal assistant in your iPhone. When the question is hard, it doesn't get processed on the phone. Instead, it is sent to a huge data center with big bulk computers, and it gets processed there, and the, re the, the reply is displayed in the Siri or Siri Talk Siri. So in a similar way, the robots can also use um, this idea to offload some of their heavy computation to a data center. This allows us to build very uh, smart, low-cost, and very lightweight robots, because although they have access to huge computers and large storage, they don't have to carry them all around. They can access through their wireless. So in order to illustrate this concept, here is what we did. We took one of the cheapest robots out there, and we added a few sensors, and gave it a, a very tiny computer that is smaller than a credit card. And then we asked it to do 3D mapping. 
Now, a mapping a space in 3D is a very, very computationally expensive task. And it's practically impossible to do it with this computer. But thanks to the wireless and the data center technologies, our robot was able to seamlessly offload most of the computation to a data center which was thousands of kilometers away, actually in Ireland, to build a 3D map of my office at ETH. So this shows how building an internet will allow us to build smart, low-cost, and lightweight robots. So now, to summarize, <coughs> so these are the three ingredients um, that are necessary to create an internet for robots, and we have seen how these things can help us in robots in different ways. But the examples I show are just a few first steps in building an internet. There needs to be a lot of things done to realize this dream. Um, I hope um, um, I motivated some of you, the, especially the high schoolers, um, to join me in this dream and uh, uh, build really smart robots that can be really useful for us in the future. Finally, I would like to finish with this quote, no robot is an island. And this is the full team that's behind the work I described. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank the European Commission and the organizers here to giving me the opportunity and for you all for listening. Thank you.